Good evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, this uh, webinar. We're going to allow a few minutes for as many attendees to connect as possible, and then we'll get started uh, in just a few minutes. Hi, everybody. Again, just wanted to let you know we're connected and ready to go. We're just going to allow a few more minutes for some more attendees to join the conference, and then we'll, we'll get started. Just a couple more minutes. Okay, so why don't we get started? We have a lot to do and um, you know, like any other weeknight for parents, I'm sure it's extremely busy. We want you all to be able to get back to dinner and, and baseball and helping with homework. So um, in, in that vein, we'll get started. My name is Mark Kowalski. I'm one of the shoulder and elbow and sports medicine surgeons at ONS. Um, and I'm gonna welcome in a moment our um, important partners in the community, our, our clinicians from Performance Optimal Health as well. ONS is a, an orthopedic and multi-specialty practice that's been rooted in the community for about 25 years. Um, and we are a fellowship specialty driven practice taking care of both older and younger athletes alike. And um, as I'm sure many of you already know, we've spent many years taking care of student athletes at every level of competition from our youngest athletes to high school and college. And these talks are, are a great opportunity for us to reach out to students and parents alike to talk about student welfare and athletic wellness to make sure that our athletes stay injury free. Um, I'm going to welcome our partners from Performance Optimal Health that also have at least 20 years experience in our community. And in a moment, I'm going to pass the uh, virtual podium to Ashley Moriarty, who's a physical therapist, an orthopedic clinical specialist and director of performance uh, optimal health in their new Canaan location, who will be discussing the importance of sleep and performance for the student athlete in the, in the spirit of injury prevention. We're also going to welcome Nick as well, who's a strength and conditioning specialist who specializes in both young and adult athlete performance. And he's going to discuss the controversial, but incredibly important topic of strength and conditioning for our youngest athletes, both competitively during the season 
and in their off season with the goal of minimizing injury and maximizing their performance on the field. And also we're gonna welcome Ariana to the podium who is a mental performance consultant who specializes in youth athletic performance. And she's gonna discuss the important relationship between stress injury and the athlete's mindset. So before beginning my portion of the talk, I'm going to pass the podium to Ashley to speak briefly on um, performance optimal health's history in the community. Thank you, Dr. Kowalski. We are super excited to be community partners with you guys on some of these webinars. Like you said, it's so important um, to just be able to provide some education to the people that we're treating, the people that we're seeing, and the people who we live among. So this is fantastic. Um, Dr. Kowalski just briefly mentioned what we're each going to be speaking on, but I just wanted to take a second to introduce performance as a whole. We are a health and wellness company. Uh, we take a unique approach to our clients' health because we look at more than just their physical being, right? So we look at their exercise routines, their recovery and their sleep, how they manage nutrition, and then most importantly, how they manage stress. And then we work with them to make sure that whatever they need, we can provide in some form or fashion. So our team consists of physical therapists, athletic trainers, strength and conditioning coaches, mental performance consultants, nutritionists, Pilates, exercise physiologists, massage therapists. So we have a couple of those disciplines on the call tonight to kind of bring you a well-rounded well perspective in terms of making sure our student athletes stay healthy and in the game. Great, thanks for that. I'm gonna go ahead and get my um, talk started. Um, And while we do that, I just want to remind everybody that we will be taking questions throughout our talks. So you'll notice a Q&A function on your Zoom call. As we give our talks, if questions come to mind about um, you or your student athlete, feel free to type those questions in. And in between each talk, we'll try to take a moment and answer as many questions as we can. As we move along in the talk, we will still address questions by answering them in the Q&A window if we weren't able to get to them uh, during the actual conversation. So feel free to be interactive. I think it makes it much more worthwhile that way for, for everyone. So my uh, first portion of the talk is to talk about the dangers of sports specialization. It's an incredibly important and controversial topic. We have a ton of children, 30 million children participating in organized sports. 30% of these kids, even at the youngest level are specialized. Young athletes are, as we all know, are specializing in sports at a younger and younger age. And the truth is this has consequences as we, as we will see. Three and a half million kids under the age of 14 are treated annually for sports injuries each year. And the vast majority of these injuries are overuse injuries and therefore by definition preventable. So what does it mean to specialize in sports? It means intensive training or competition in an organized sport for at least eight months out of the year participating in one sport to the exclusion of other sports, involvement of our youngest kids, even younger than 12, 12 years old, and um, organized play at the expense of overall free play, which is incredibly important for the overall well-being of our kids. So I want to ask two questions in this portion of the talk. One of the things we always ask about is, is sports early specialization safe? Does it increase the risk of injury in our young athletes? But I also want to talk about whether it's even effective. We're going to talk about whether it's safe and its impact on injury. A lot of what our other speakers are going to talk about is how to minimize injury. But we also want to know, does it even help parents and kids accomplish their goal of achieving elite status in their sport? And I think where early specialization came from is this rule of the 10-year or 10,000-hour rule popularized by Malcolm Gladwell in his book. And, and he extrapolated a couple of important classic studies, the first of which was done in 1973 based on master chess um, uh, competitors. And the other was based on uh, composers of classical music. And essentially what these two studies found is that for um, chess masters, they needed at least 10,000 uh, hours of practice to become a master. And when uh, John Hayes looked at the 500 most important works in classical music over the 17 and 1800s, he found that none of them occurred 
before the composer had 10 years of experience and thus was born the 10 year, 10,000 hour rule. And the work by Erickson and colleagues also was sort of at the foundation of the importance of what they called deliberate practice or early commitment to the acquisition of expert performance. And this 10,000 hour rule has really taken on a life of its own. And we'll talk about whether it's valid in achieving master status and whether it's safe. The concern with our youngest kids is that they are not yet fully formed or developed. Their bones and their joints are still growing. They have open growth plates where the bones are getting longer and bigger. And these growth plates, while important, are fragile. It's the weak link in the chain. And if we subject these skeletally immature kids to too much unnatural or excessive activity, those growth plates are likely to fail either by fracturing perhaps or by developing inflammation and pain. Well, what are the risk factors for injury due to early specialization? First of all, early specialization usually requires year-round training. It usually requires repetitive high-risk mechanics like throwing a baseball, which is an incredibly unnatural act. And it exerts significant competitive demands on our youngest athletes. By definition, early specialization entails more frequent, intense formal competition in the form of tournaments, for example. These competitions are associated with increased risk of injury as opposed to casual training or practice. And oftentimes these youngest athletes are not allowed adequate time for rest and recovery. I'm not gonna go into too much detail about the psychosocial aspects because we're gonna talk a lot more about this from an expert in mental health, but it's important for our youngest kids to enjoy their activities, to have a sense of control over their own lives, they don't respond favorably to isolation, which can occur when a seventh grader is playing on the varsity team. And they're less able to participate with others outside of their peer group. Seventh graders can't really relate to 11th graders, for example. And finally, the stress and anxiety that comes with playing at a high level is often too much for a young child to handle. Well, what's the effect? The effect is ultimately psychological burnout. And I think in the interest of time, I'm gonna leave this here and I'm gonna allow more elaboration on the topic from an actual expert in the field. So the bottom line though is whether we're talking about burnout or whether we're talking about injury risk, early specialization is not safe by the numbers, by the data published in peer reviewed literature. The injury risk is increased if pitchers pitch more than eight months out of the year, Injury risk is increased if there's no break from a single sport, at least for one season out of the year. And there's an increased risk in injury if we um, compel our youngest kids to specialize before the age of 12. And what we know as a general rule is that increased organized play over free play doubles the injury risk over the young lifetime of a student athlete. What we also know is that the 10,000 hour rule probably doesn't apply. Even though it was very interesting to read about in Michael, Malcolm Gladwell's book, there have been many articles written, long form essays and research that has shown that more important than the hours are actually the quality of training. Genetics are exceedingly important. It's really hard to overcome whether or not you had a sibling or parent who already demonstrated the ability to achieve elite status in sports. So really the 10 year, 10,000 hour rule um, doesn't hold water as we have later found out. And there's a lot of ways to look at this. You can either look at athletes that specialize early and see if they eventually achieve elite status. And when you look at countries like China or Russia who identify and compel the youngest athletes who show promise to specialize, you see a significant amount of those kids dropping out and failing to achieve elite status. You can also look at elite athletes and track backwards in the research and see, did these elite ath athletes specialize early or did they in fact diversify playing more than one sport at the youngest ages? And what you in fact find is that NCAA division one scholarship athletes and professional athletes, as well as those that participated on national teams were more likely to diversify. And you can look at the other side of that coin. You can look at a cohort that diversified and you find that the kids that diversify are more likely to achieve elite status in sports than their counterparts who chose to specialize. So in summary, early specialization is neither safe nor effective. And we hope that this information will compel parents that there might be a better path to empowering their children and securing that division one scholarship, or maybe even achieving national team or professional sport participation. There's benefits to early diversification as a litany of pro and international sport organizations have identified. Enhanced physical literacy, 
There's a clear crossover effect where lacrosse helps somebody become a better hockey player, development of motor skills that are beneficial to the, a variety of sports, the psychological and cognitive skills that we'll learn about later, and again, overall psychological well being and a lower risk of burnout and eventual quitting of their chosen sport. There's some guidelines for specific sports. I think baseball is probably the one where there are the most guidelines to try to avoid the negative impacts of early specialization. Observing pitch counts and rest periods over the course of a season, no overhead throwing for at least two to three months out of the year, no competition for four months out of the year, avoiding pitching more than 100 innings over the course of a year, avoiding pitching for multiple overlapping teams, don't play as a pitcher on one team and a catcher on another team simultaneously and avoid radar guns and showcases. These are guidelines set forth by Little League, supported by Major League Baseball to keep these kids safe in baseball. And there are some general strategies across all sports. First of all, continue to provide opportunities for our kids to have free unstructured play. You wanna make sure that their weekly hours of organized sport to free play remains below two to one. You wanna make sure that the weekly hours dedicated to a single sport does not exceed the child's age per week or a maximum of 16 hours. Avoid specializing before the age of 13, no matter how tempting it might be in the hopes that they'll be able to excel in their sport. And finally, as we will learn about later, the importance of a structured strength and conditioning program. So with that, I'm gonna conclude that portion of the talk and um, let our next speaker take over. I think it dovetails nicely with a discussion of the importance of mental health and psychological well-being. Um, and it looks like, thankfully, we don't yet have any questions, but we'll continue to keep an eye on the Q&A box. Please feel free to ask questions. I mean, it helps us certainly to make sure the talk is germane to each individual attending the, uh, the conference. Um, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Ariana and we'll keep moving forward. Thank you, Dr. Kowalski, appreciate it. Hi everyone, my name is Ariana Martinetti. I am the Mental Performance Consultant at Performance Optimal Health, and I have background in sport and performance psychology, as well as clinical mental health counseling. So Dr. Kowalski mentioned a bit about burnout and early sports specialization, which I'll also mention this evening. And the characteristics of burnout in sport involve an athlete having a reduced sense of accomplishment, feeling devalued, and this can also come in the form of either devalued from their sport or starting to feel some resentment towards their sport, their coaches, or their teammates. And it also involves exhaustion, and exhaustion in both the forms of mental and physical exhaustion. And what are some risk factors of burnout? This includes high training demands, which Dr. Kowalski mentioned. Early specialization has also been found um, to be correlated with athletes at the co collegiate level having higher levels of burnout. Monotonous practices, so the same thing over and over again, and now this can come from either the aspect of the coach not switching up practices, or it can come from the athlete perceiving that they're just starting to go through the motions in their sport. So this tends to then involve withdrawing motivationally, even if the athlete is still physically participating in their sport. Low social support, and again, this comes from a perceived lack of social support. So a coach or a parent or a teammate may think that there's great team cohesion going on, and an athlete may um, be feeling isolated or not feeling as related uh, to others on their team. And also low levels of personal control, and we also like to call this autonomy. So this also involves not feeling like they may have a choice or a say in the matter or in their sport. For example, for youth athletes, um, they do not necessarily have control over their practice schedules or how many um, games or tournaments get scheduled within a season. They may also not have as much say over which sport they may want to play. So I'll talk a little bit about preventative factors in a moment. And I do want to bring your attention to the fact that there are many non-physical factors that are involved with burnout, which I hope I'm bringing your attention to tonight. So some prevention measures for burnout. Although there are no current evidence-based practices to treating burnout once it occurs in an athlete, there are some recommendations and prevention really being the best practice here. So one we have is scheduling breaks or scheduling some time off. And this may not be a coach or even an athlete's first choice, but research has shown that it is time well spent. 
And although there are several theories as to how athletes develop burnout, one of them in particular has to do with athletes developing one a one-dimensional identity. And this also goes back to what Dr. Kowalski was mentioning with early sports specialization, where an athlete may be dedicating a lot or a majority of their time to just one sport, which limits other social interactions or opportunities to develop, to develop other interests or habits. So this isn't always a problem for all athletes, but for some athletes, they may, may perceive this constraint as an issue, which may then develop into burnout. So if there are scheduled breaks, especially around certain holidays or social events, then this can allow athletes um, some time for sufficient rest and recovery and also some ways to develop other areas of their life. Enhancing relationships either on a team level or across other teams or between coach-athlete relationship or even with certain parents or guardians. A process focus. So researchers have found that a lot of burnout components come from athletes focusing on outcome and especially being in a culture where it seems to always being focused on winning. This can not only increase anxiety, but it can also contribute to a lot of external pressure that not all athletes may be well equipped to handle at times. So focusing on more of a process versus an outcome can contribute to lowering these levels of burnout. So this can include um, setting setting specific personal goals for athletes or creating competition against one's own performances rather than against other teammates, such as in practice. And also multi-sport participation. So again, going back to having the ability to look at different interests and also having that ability um, to not necessarily develop one identity of being an athlete. Another theory as to why some athletes experience burnout is this theory of entrapment, feeling like they've been a part of it for so long that they're obligated to remain in their sport. This is also one of the reasons why athletes can still play even if they're experiencing burnout versus just dropping out of their sport per se. So having this opportunity to be involved in other sports may decrease some of those feelings of obligations with one particular sport. And I'd also like to bring our attention to the three basic psychological needs, um, and this comes from the theory of self-determination. So autonomy involves an athlete having a personal choice or feeling like they have somewhat of control. An example of this might be... Um, uh, a coach allowing the athletes to pick the warm up at the beginning of a practice or allowing the order of what skills they may be doing during practice. Um, for some instances, if there's not a lot of room to offer choice for athletes, then at the very least offering rationale, understanding the why as to why athletes are doing things. This can go a long way. And especially for youth athletes, feeling like they have some sense of choice or say in the matter. For competence, this relates to an athlete feeling as if they're capable and meeting up their own expectations of being able to perform. So one way to try and increase competence could be setting specific personal goals or um, optimal challenges for an individual. If something's way too difficult and they can't achieve it, that could lower levels of competence. If something's way too easy and an athlete easily achieves it, that can also decrease competence. So finding an optimal challenge, which of course is very individualized for certain athletes. And lastly, relatedness, which re revolves around having a sense of belonging. Um, and this can come from a teammate perspective, feeling like they're a part of the sport or they belong in the sport. And researchers have found that the more athletes can fulfill these three needs of autonomy, competence, and relatedness, then the more self-determined they are going to feel in their sport. And higher levels of self-determined motivation or intrinsic motivation has also been found to be correlated with lower, lower levels of burnout. So feeling like they want to be there and be a part of it versus some sort of external obligation or pressure. And to move into another thing that I want to mention in relation to burnout, and Dr. Kowalski mentioned overuse injuries, I'd also like to bring your attention to the non-physical factors that may be involved with an athlete getting injured or hurt during their sport. So similar to those non-physical factors with burnout, I now like to discuss some non-physical factors between the stress and injury, injury relationship with athletes before I pass it off to Nick. 
So as Dr. Kowalski mentioned, sport participation is already putting an athlete at a vulnerable spot or position to get injured. However, not every bad tackle or um, defending another individual or catching a ball or going after a ball leads to a sport injury. So although physical factors are the primary cause of sport participation, uh, injury in sport, excuse me, I'd also like to discuss the relationship between stress and an athlete's psychological factors that are at play. So this can come in the form of life, life stressors, personality factors, or coping resources. For example, an athlete may be running late to practice or trying to find a parking spot or getting in an argument with their parent or sibling on their way to their either competition or their practice. So this can contribute to some stress that the athlete is feeling. Therefore, they can have some increased muscle tension, which even if you are all checking in with your bodies right now, maybe your shoulders could be lowered a couple inches, or maybe you notice that your hands were tense or your arms were tense. It can also involve attentional disruptions. So athletes need to be able to shift from internal to external focuses and one to two cues to many cues at a time. For example, athletes need to either plan out what the next play might be, where they need to set themselves up to get something from a teammate or to defend another individual, and then shift their focus to the actual play that is going on at that time. So very quick shifts in their attentional focus, which can become um, inhibited by certain stress that they might be experiencing, or if they have increased anxiety, especially if, if they're unable to cope with how they might be feeling. Um, for example, freshmen that might be attending college for the first time and moving away from school, high so uh, moving away from home to a new school, excuse me. That could be a large contributor of stress. And now they're expected to go play or perform um, and it can contribute to this increased muscle tension, attentional disruptions, an increase in anxiety, um, generalized fatigue, um, or even coordination breakdowns. However, I do wanna mention that we may not always be able to control the stressors that we might be experiencing, but we can control the mental skills interventions that can be used. So this can include relaxation training, energy management, self-talk, imagery, and increasing confidence in ways to, to help manage pressure better, which is one thing that I do with a lot of athletes and performers. Um, so this is the psychological side of um, injury prevention. So I mentioned some examples um, from burnout and sport and how that can be prevented, as well as ways that we, from a psychological standpoint, can try and limit what goes on in the middle here um, to then prevent injury. And now I would like to pass it off to Nick, who can speak to us about proper strength and conditioning training programs. Thank you. Thanks for the perfect pass off. Let's see if I can share the screen, right? That's great. Hey, Nicholas, while you're pulling up your talk, I might just ask a question of Ariana as we make the transition. You know, a lot of our attendees may not be familiar with sports psychology or that there are psychologists and mental health professionals that specialize in, in young athletes. And I came across as I prepare some of my information that some of, some of this psychological burnout can manifest as an actual mental health condition like depression, anxiety, or even eating disorder. When parents are faced with this situation, it can be distressing and they may not know where to turn. Can you talk a little bit about what first steps they should take if they are observing con significant consequences of burnout and where they should go first? Do they go directly to a psychologist with your expertise? Do they start with their pediatrician? What, what kind of guidance can you offer above and beyond prevention? Thanks, Dr. Kowalski, and I'm glad that you mentioned that because um, prior to all of the more recent research that we have now, um, a lot of individuals didn't recognize that burnout was actually being associated with more of these serious mental health concerns, like you mentioned, depression and eating disorders. So first thing is definitely acknowledging that something might be going on. So you mentioned that parents would be observing this in their children, um, having a conversation, because a lot of times athletes, especially youth athletes, know something isn't right, but aren't necessarily 
really able to pinpoint what that might be. So opening the door for the conversation with their athlete, um, or if coaches have a good enough relationship that they're willing to listen to them and have a good rapport with them, then getting some insight in that way. Um, and then, yes, I would say either reach out to a mental health professional or someone in the sport world that specializes in that because it is also a unique experience being an athlete. Um, and then of course, with certain professionals, they can always refer to other specialists such as an eating disorder specialist or a pediatrician if it's also leading to some um, physical overuse injuries as well. Thank you. Um, all right, awesome. Uh, so for my portion of the talk, uh, we're going to go into a little bit more about the athletic development um, from a fitness and strength and conditioning standpoint. Uh, my name is Nick DeMeglio, and a little bit about me uh, is my background. Uh, I have a bachelor's of science uh, in exercise science and physiology from Springfield College. Um, I'm a certified strength and conditioning spe specialist. Um, I was a strength and conditioning coach at Northeastern University, uh, which is a division one school, division one program. And I worked mostly with the track uh, and field teams, as well as the field hockey teams and the soccer teams. Currently, I'm the head strength and conditioning coach at the New Canaan Racquet Club through Performance, uh, where I work with their um, high performance youth program. Uh, basically taking these kids from ages of eight years old all the way up to 18 years old um, and putting them through a solid program to build out their movement patterns and then increase their performance while on the court. Um, I also play division three baseball at Springfield College, a um, little tidbit on that. Um, so I do have a little bit of a good experience as far as the collegiate setting goes um, and kind of how to build an a athlete to get to that point. Um, so building the youth athlete, and I think this is something that the other presenters have touched on a little bit, but there's different stages to the athletic development, um, and they typically go by age. So uh, ages about 8 to 12, really what we're looking for is to build very general skills. So what's a, what's a kid's ability to run, change direction? Um, we'll implement some easy body weight activities just to kind of get them used to doing exercise. Um, not many people really enjoy exercise. Um, so getting them to kind of find this to be fun and competitive is really important because we want them to enjoy their experience with this, especially at such a young age. We don't want to put too much pressure. We don't want to start having them lift too many weights before they're physically ready to um, from either a development standpoint or a psychological standpoint. You know, we want them to feel like they're, they're having fun, they're getting along with their friends, they're building a community with their team, um, and we're creating a really fun and competitive environment. Um, I really try to focus on that competitive environment um, a lot with that age as well, because I do find that competitiveness is a skill. Um, so being a skill, you need to make sure that you are using that at a very, very young age um, and then building that into kind of that eye of the tiger mentality so that when you are a little bit older and you want to go play at a collegiate sport, you know, you really want to make sure that you are capable of competing. And I think if you're not training that at a really young age, you may miss out on that a little bit. Um, once we get towards ages 12 to 15, this is kind of in the middle of puberty for, for most kids. Um, this is where we're starting to get into more motor control of basic movement patterns. So a lot of these kids have finally gone through their growth spurts. They're readjusting to new heights, new limb lengths. And so we're basically just trying to get them to adjust to their new bodies. Um, so we're going to take them first through really, really basic movement patterns. So are they able to squat? Are they able to hinge, which most people may know as more of a deadlift position? Um, are, are they able to push? Are they able to pull? Are they able to lunge? Um, things of that nature. So once they have that movement competency, then we can start looking into introducing resistance training. So adding external load. Um, again, big factor on that is we want to make sure that they have that motor control before we load them too much. Most of the literature that you see, um, there's really minimal risk as far as strength training goes once you hit ages 12, kind of to 18. But the main injuries occur when there's no supervision and when they the athlete hasn't gone through the proper um, skill learning section 
Um, so they don't have the, the basic movement patterns that we're looking for down um, in order to effectively perform the exercise. So if they don't have the proper movement patterns down and you're trying to add too much external load, that's when injuries can occur. Um, but if the movement pattern is down and you start increasing that resistance training, that external load, um, really there's no risk uh, associated with um, athletic development at those ages. Um, so again, ages 12 to 15, we're really focusing on performing movements as perfectly as possible before we increase load. Um, I'll touch on this a little bit later, but that is sometimes hard, especially for, for kids that are new to the resistance training, strength training program, because they kind of want to test themselves. This is something that's new and novel to them. So they kind of want to see, okay, how much can I bench press or how much can I squat? Um, and again, if they don't have those movement patterns down, that's where we see risk. Um, increased risk of injury. Once you kind of get to ages 15 to 18 plus, that's really when we're looking to target those more specific skills. So this is where we do a needs analysis of the sport. What type of things does that sport need, right? So are they more of a sprinting sport? Are they more of a strength sport? Are they overhead athletes? Um, do they need more explosiveness? Uh, or more endurance. So there's many different um, variables that we can train um, to be more specific with the demand of that sport. Um, and then ages eight, 15 to 18 plus is kind of where we start to implement those a little bit more. Um, they also need a yearly periodization to maximize the potential and avoid the burnout. So this is where a, a good strength and conditioning coach should kind of view the yearly macro cycle of the training program and really pinpoint what times of the year the athlete needs to be pulling on what levers. Um, so, you know, you have your, your strength lever, your endurance level, your speed level, and your power development level. And I'll talk about those a little bit more in a minute. Um, but you want to make sure that at different points of the year, you're pulling on different levers so that you're getting the most out of the athlete. And that, again, they're avoiding burnout. Um, I think Ariana mentioned um, monotonous practices in one of her slides. And so with the strength training, we wanna make sure that we're not just doing the same exercises over and over and over again, and that we are changing that up just a little bit. So again, it's a novel experience for the athlete as they go through their development. Um, so creating adaptations with resistance training, uh, the first type of adaptations that you'll see whenever anybody, youth athlete or adult athlete starts a training program is they create neural adaptations. So in the first six to eight weeks, um, and this depends on their training age, so more advanced an athlete is, um, the less time this will take. The more new an athlete is, the longer it may take. They'll see improvements in motor control of the movement, and that's typically what causes the initial increase in strength. After that first six to eight weeks of a training program, uh, they start making functional adaptations. So this is changes to the cross-sectional area of the muscle tissue. So basically their muscles are hypertrophying, getting bigger in size, um, different things from an aerobic standpoint as well. Your, your heart is getting better at pumping blood through the body. Your uh, muscle cells are getting better at utilizing the oxygen stores. Um, so really uh, after the first six to eight weeks, the next four to six weeks are really where the um, functional adaptations take place. Uh, below that, we can see what the trainable qualities that I look for are, and their strength, speed, power, and endurance. And the number one that I kind of look for is the power side of things for most athletes, because power is basically a combination of strength and speed. And that's what most athletes are really looking for. Unless you're a 100 meter dash runner, most athletes need to be really, really strong, and they need to be able to use that speed really, really quickly. Um, so the power component, the power trainable quality is kind of the one that I look at the most. Um, so now I want to go into a bit of what that yearly periodization should look for for athletes to, again, avoid burnout, but to also then maximize their training potential. So in the early off season, um, your focus should be more on the endurance and that basic foundation of strength. So this typically starts about six months before the competitive season. Um, and it should last about four to six weeks, the early off season portion. This is where we wanna reintroduce the athlete to basic resistance training movements. So your squats, your hinges, your pushes, your pulls, um, and things of that nature. 
Um, you're really looking for 50 to 70% of their strength, uh, which is not exactly a high intensity movement and can typically be done for sets of about 10 to 15 reps, somewhere in that range. You're looking to recreate some of those neural adaptations. So reintroducing, reintroducing to those movements so that they gain more competency. You're looking for higher volume, lower loads and slower speeds. Um, when we talk about more of the endurance side of things, this is maybe going for your 5K runs, your, your five to 10 mile longer, slower runs um, to really build up your aerobic capacity. Um, for strength, it's maybe doing three sets of 10 on, on a squat with about 50 to 70% of what their one rep max would be. Uh, it also is a low utilization of the stretch shortening cycle, which is basically the elasticity of the muscles. So we're so far away from where the season starts that we don't want to have to use that elasticity too much. Um, again, we're looking to rebuild that um, basic foundation. The later off season, this lasts about four to six weeks and occurs immediately after the early off season. This is again, an increased focus on the basic strength patterns, but now we're getting more up into the higher intensity. So we're going more about 75 to 90% of an athlete's one rep max, which should typically be taken for about three to maybe eight reps at the most. This is where we're really creating those functional adaptations that we talked about earlier and occurs with moderate volumes, load and moderate speeds. And we're still using low stretching, stretch shortening cycle utilization. Uh, I missed a slide. Um, so after that, we'll get more into our preseason, which typically occurs um, four to eight weeks before the beginning of the competitive season. Uh, and this is a shift more into a power and increased strength um, and starting to get into the sport specific movements as well. Uh, this is increasing the need for power production, which I talked about before as being um, the number one um, trainable quality that I look for with most, most athletes. Uh, this is where the, the volume starts to decrease, but the intensity and the speed with which the movements are done starts to increase. So this becomes more moderate to high stretch shortening cycle utilization. So we're really looking for the athlete to become more elastic at this point in time. So if you see the picture I have over on the right, it's more of like a medicine ball throw. So again, they're taking that medicine ball and they're trying to throw that kind of as hard and as powerfully as they can with really, really high velocities. This is gonna transfer much better to sport um, than some of those lower load, lower speed activities done in the early off season. And then once we get to the competitive season, we're really increasing that power production and the focus is a little bit more on speed. We wanna really decrease the volume that we use. Um, however, that's also based on the athletes playing time. So if an athlete is a starter and plays on multiple teams, um, they really don't need as much from a strength and conditioning standpoint. But if the athlete is maybe somebody who doesn't play as much is maybe a third string or second string, um, you know, rides the bench a little bit, this is where we can take those same athletes and create a separate program for them so that they're start continuing to get better as the season goes. And they're not just doing the same program as somebody who's a starter, whose um, our overall training volume is much, much higher. So the low hanging fruit to improve performance that I think we can all focus on is learn how to move well before you move under high levels of stress. So I don't want any egos in the weight room. I don't want kids coming in there trying to lift as much as they possibly can right off the bat. If they don't have that movement pattern down, that's going to lead to injury. And if they actually focus on moving well, they're gonna find that they perform much better on the field or on the court. You also wanna improve your force absorption abilities. So a lot of times we focus on how much can, you know, how much can an athlete bench press or squat or how high can they jump without looking at more of the loading um, and landing mechanics as well. Um, so how well can you use your brakes? When you look at the best athletes, the best athletes are the ones who are able to stop as quickly as possible. So if you're not working on those brakes and you're not working on slowing down as fast as you can, I know that sounds counterintuitive, but you want to slow down as fast as you can. Um, that will also really increase your performance. Uh, you wanna maintain exercise selection for more than eight weeks. Uh, I don't like playing exercise roulette. If I find an exercise that works really well, we wanna make sure that we go through the process of creating neural adaptations 
and functional adaptation. So again, the athlete becomes a better performer. Uh, and then lastly, I wanna make sure that the athlete understands that they have to trust the process, they have to stay consistent and they have to delay immediate gratification. So kind of going back to those same high school kids who wanna bench press as much as they can, we have to make sure that they understand that if they trust the process and they go through the proper yearly periodization, that they will eventually be able to get stronger and they'll be able to test their limits, but they have to make sure that they get there in a safe manner. Um, all right, and I believe after that, I'm done and I will pass the mic off to Ashley. Thanks, Nick. I'm actually gonna take take it from here first and I think okay. Ashley is gonna finish up with us, but I do wanna, I mean, two great talks about topics that are essential for parents and kids to avoid burnout and injury, frankly. And just, I mean, your, your talk was so comprehensive and I think they got everything they needed from it. But in brief, what would you say the three pitfalls would be to watch out for in a younger kid and parent thinking about initiating strength and conditioning for the first time? Uh, limiting load, I think going back to just making sure that the kid is having fun. Um, some of the games that I, I play with the youth athletes that I train at the moment are as simple as um, sharks and minnows games, duck, duck, goose games, um, you know, kind of really, really fun activities that the kids will enjoy, um, but are also then building the movement patterns that I, I'm looking for. Um, so when they're playing duck, duck, goose, as silly as that may sound, they're actually working on acceleration and running in a curvy linear pattern. So they're running in a circle. Um, and that's typically something that you have to be able to do when you're playing sport. Um, so games as simple as that, while they may seem silly from an outsider's point of view, um, those really actually start to develop those trainable qualities that we look for when they get to become older athletes. That's great. And, and what I also took from your talk, which I think is so important, is it has to be age appropriate and experience yep. appropriate, which is, I think, a lot of what you talked about with the, the motion and movement patterns and supervised. You don't want kids yeah. tooling around in yeah. the gym by themselves, which I think where yeah. is where somebody like you is so important yeah. to make sure they stay safe. Yes, that's great. Thank you. So I'm going to move a little bit quickly just so we don't keep you too long. Um, but I think this this sort of takes off from Nick's concept of consistency. You know, we talked about a mental health and well-being. We talked about the importance of strength and conditioning. And now we're going to move into uh, nutrition, hydration, and sleep and injury prevention. And nothing could be more true uh, um, in terms of consistency than maintaining consistent diet and hydration patterns in our athletes. So a brief word on a balanced diet for athletes. Most of their um, calories should come from carbohydrates, about half. About a third of their Calories should in fact come from fat, but we'll make sure that it's the right kind of fat. And then about a quarter of their calories should come from protein. And we'll talk about each of these. So carbohydrates are the major source of energy for our athletes. Our athletes use these carbs to synthesize glycogen, which is their fuel source. And here are some guidelines. As, as Nick pointed out, the goals for strength and conditioning are different between an endurance athlete and a collision athlete. And similarly, they're, they're, um, nutritional needs are different. So endurance athletes are going to need a little bit more carbs than a high intensity athlete, where an endurance athlete would need about 10 grams per kilograms per day. And if we look at these guidelines in terms of the average, let's say 150 pound high school football player, a high intensity athlete will take about 350 grams of carbs per day. Um, and before training about an hour to four hours before training, they want to take about 70 grams of these carbs in order to provide fuel for their training or competition. And then afterwards, it's important to refuel. We want these athletes to take in another 100 grams of carbs two or three hours after training to prepare for the next training, or in fact, if they're participating in a tournament for their next bout of competition. Now, what, where do they get their carbs? Well, we all know about pasta, of course. It's probably the most ubiquitous carb. And, and as you can see here, a typical bowl of of our a cup of cooked spaghetti will have about 40 grams. So just to use it as an example, as a measuring stick, they might need at least two cups of pasta after their uh, competition in order to refuel. Um, protein, as I mentioned, about a quarter of their calories should come from protein. 
And the role of protein is that they contain amino acids. And these amino acids are the building blocks for muscle. So when kids are focusing on strength and conditioning, as important is making sure they provide protein in order to build the muscle that they're working on in the gym. So the recommended daily allowance for protein in general is about one gram per kilogram per day, but it's gonna be higher for our athletes. In this case though, whereas endurance athletes need more carbs, our strength and collision athletes need more protein. They need at least 1.5 to two grams per kilogram per day of protein in their, in their diet. So again, if you look at that 150 pound football player um, taking in 1.5 grams per kilogram per day, they wanna take in about 100 grams of protein over the course of their day in their diet. And where do we get our protein from? Where there's a litany of sources of protein, that's the good news. We know about meat, fish, and chicken. Those are gonna be the high ticket items, but actually beans, cooked lentils, quinoa, although I know a lot of our kids don't love quinoa, peas and peanut butter, these are all great sources of protein, as are dairy, cottage cheese, Greek yogurt, milk, and, and, um, and the like, and eggs also contain a significant amount of protein. So it doesn't all have to come from meat. We want them to have a diversified diet while meeting their caloric requirements. And this brings up the, the concept of protein shakes. And I think maybe when I hand off to Ashley in a little while, Nick can provide some, some feedback on protein shakes. This is my non-expert opinion, my, my sort of orthopedic effort to cultivate the knowledge. But again, protein shakes like protein in our food provides amino acids to build muscle. A lot of our kids want to use protein shakes. And if you take a survey of a room of, of high school football players, you are probably gonna find that the majority of them are now using protein as an adjunct to their diet. When they use these protein shakes, the timing of their meal is important. They wanna use the protein shake um, within hours of their workout. It's called the anabolic window. It's, it's when they best can use the, this protein to rebuild the muscle that they've just broken down during the course of their workout. And in general, whey protein is the best. It's readily available. Um, commercially, it's easily digested and appears quickly in the bloodstream, and it has leucine, a molecule that is uniquely beneficial for muscle synthesis. Um, in terms of consistency and habit and being thoughtful about what athletes consume, I always encourage athletes, whether we're talking about their meals in general or protein shakes in particular, to turn the, can the, the container around turn the bottle around and read the label to know what you're putting in your body. And in general, what happens with protein shakes is they don't taste very good. So companies try to make them taste as good as possible by adding a ton of sugar. And you wanna make sure you minimize carbs unless you're purposely using them for refuel as I've just discussed. You also wanna make sure it has a clean label. The higher the degree of competition, the more eyeballs are gonna be examining what these athletes put into their body and whether it is allowed. So a good way to do this is to look at the NSF Certified for Sports label. It's a shortcut to make sure that you're using a clean product that aren't going to get our athletes into trouble. And now on to fat, probably the controversial component of diet. As it turns out, about a third of calories should come from fat, but it has to be healthy fat. So what I, I try to encourage our, our youngest athletes to consider is eliminate processed foods and fast foods from their diet. It's of course hard. We don't expect them to eat zero fast food or zero slices of pizza. But the truth is the elite athletes that they're about to watch in Major League Baseball playoffs right now are not typically not eating processed foods, at least during the season. We wanna eliminate those saturated fats and trans fats, the donuts and the breakfast sandwiches and pizza and, and burgers from McDonald's. Instead, we wanna lean on healthy fats. And these come from plant oils, avocado, nuts and seeds and soft margarines. There are healthy fats to be had and this is what our athletes should consume. So that's kind of a general thought of what they should eat, but as important is when they should eat it. We talked about protein shakes right off the field or right after workouts. I'm hoping Nick will provide some feedback on that to make sure I'm giving good advice. Um, but timing of our meals is incredibly important. So there should be a pre-exercise meal and it shouldn't occur any, any sooner than one to two hours before a bout of training or competition. And it should be a relatively small meal. It should only be about 200 to 500 calories. It should consist primarily of easily digestible carbohydrates like oatmeal, granola, or wheat bread, for example. Avoid high fat, avoid high fiber. And again, back to the concept of consistency, 
choose familiar foods. Athletes should be all about habits and routines. Find out what works for you before a lacrosse tournament, before a football game. And that should be your go-to meal each and every week or each and every game. What about after competition? Well, there should be two meals after competition. One should occur right afterwards within about 30 minutes and another one within one to two hours. And this allows us again to refuel with respect to our glycogen, to provide additional carbohydrates so we're ready for the next bout of competition. Um, we want these to be again, high in carbohydrate, a little bit of protein to rebuild muscle and nutrient dense. So right off the field, this can be orange slices, it can be banana and peanut butter, a nutrition bar is an easy way to do it. And then a little bit later, it can be a more substantial meal, like a well-appointed sandwich or quinoa salad and roast vegetables, although I know that's probably a pipe dream for our youngest kids. But these are what the, the second after competition meal might look like. Now, I mentioned energy bars or nutrition bars as a great way to get that post-participation meal done. But again, just like protein shakes and, um, and everything else they consume, we want them to turn around the bottle, turn around the package and read the label. So which energy bars are good and bad depends on the label. We don't want them to have a ton of sugar. The truth is most nutrition bars are just glorified candy bars. We want them to have less than 10 to 12 grams of sugar, and we want them to have at least five to 10 grams of protein. If they satisfy these criteria, it's a reasonable choice. Things like kind bars are really good, heavy in seeds, nuts, and fruits. Things like cliff bars, even though they taste great, probably not so much. A ton of calories, a lot of chocolate, and oftentimes a lot of fat. So just be a little bit careful. And now on to hydration. So the truth is, hydration negatively impacts your health and of course also negatively impacts your performance. So if these athletes wanna perform at their highest level, they have to be hydrated. The problem is by the time an average high schooler steps onto the field, 75% of them have already last, lost the hydration battle. So we all know about the symptoms of dehydration, but how do we monitor hydration? How do we become masters of our own body to make sure we've, drink, we've, we've had enough water to be prepared? Well, there are a lot of ways to do it. We can use a thirst scale, which is pretty crude. How thirsty am I from zero to 10? We can use the color of our urine. If it's uh, dark orange, we're highly dehydrated. If it's sort of a light yellowish, we're good to go. But what I encourage athletes to do actually early on is to get a sense of how much water weight you lose over the course of a practice, over the course of a game by weighing yourself beforehand, weighing yourself afterwards. You get a sense of how much water you've lost over the course of that out of participation, and that'll allow you to determine how much water you need to take in ahead of time. But there are some general guidelines. So again, just like meals, before competition, you want to have about well, two to three cups of water an hour or two hours beforehand, and then you want to have another cup or two right before you play. During exercise, for every 15 to 20 minutes you participate, a half a cup to a cup of water. And we'll get into energy drinks, but the truth is, unless you're participating for at least 60 minutes, there is no role for something like a Gatorade or a Powerade. And after exercise, this is where the water weight lost matters. For every pound of water weight lost, we need to take in two cups of water. Now we wanna avoid overhydration. It is possible, it's very hard to do though. And again, with our youngest athletes, we're usually fighting the other battle. We're usually trying to keep them hydrated enough. So I try to encourage my kids in general to carry a water bottle around every day and make sure you're refilling your bottle in between each class or in between every other class. And that'll be a good indication that you're drinking enough water throughout the day to be ready for practice after school. Are sports energy drinks a good idea? They are helpful because they replace sweat nutrients. They replace carbohydrates, which are an important fuel source. But unless you're participating for more than 60 minutes, they're not necessary. And again, turn the bottle around, read the back of the label. Just like nutrition bars, we tend to load up energy drinks with sugar. We don't want them to have any more than six to 8% of carbohydrate. If they have more than that, too much sugar and counterproductive. And to be honest, when I travel with the US rugby team and they use Gatorade on the sidelines, they actually dilute Gatorade by half so that they make sure that they get the carbohydrates and electrolytes that they need, but they don't take in too much sugar, which can actually be counterproductive in causing dehydration and sometimes cramping. So with that, I'm gonna stop and maybe I'll just ask Nick to shed light on protein as a supplement while Ashley is pulling up the chalk. Awesome, yeah. So um, the one main question that I think I always get with, with the protein is um, you know, whether it's safe and effective for kids. Um, the, the one challenge with any sort of supplement company is that there's no FDA reg regulations on that. So we really aren't sure what goes into a lot of those products. Um, so 
like Dr. Kowalski said in a lot of his talk, make sure you're reading labels. Uh, and the one thing that I'm really looking for with any sort of protein supplement is um, that it says whey protein isolate, which is probably going to be the purest form of the whey protein that you're going to be ingesting. Um, the other two popular are uh, whey protein concentrate or a whey protein blend. Uh, and you kind of want to avoid those two because those start to blend and put in other fillers um, and they don't always lay out exactly what those are. Um, so when you're looking for any sort of whey protein supplement, you, again, you want to make sure you're looking for whey protein isolate as opposed to a whey protein concentrate or whey protein blend of any sort. Great. Thank you, Nick. Um, this was great. I think everyone has done such a fantastic job kind of shedding light on the various components of what make a well-balanced student athlete or well-balanced athlete. Um, and I'd like to tie it all together with sleep. But before I start, I already introduced the company. Um, I'm just going to introduce myself. I'm Ashley Moriarty, a physical therapist. I have a degree in both athletic training and physical therapy. I'm an orthopedic clinical specialist. I love sleep. I don't know how many of you guys who are watching love sleep, but I love sleep. I think of all the things we've talked about tonight, it is one of the most challenging things to change because there are so many factors that go into it. Um, Let's talk a little bit about the importance of sleep. Um, there are so many great things that happen when we sleep. So many different kinds of recovery and memory are created. So you've got your physical recovery, right? You are physically exhausted from the day. You are physically exhausted from your practice. You go home, you get a great night's sleep. You will physically recover. You wake up, you can do it all again tomorrow. You also have mental recovery, right? So you are giving your brain a break. Like Ariana talked about, there is that mental fatigue, there is that physical fatigue. So sleep can help with both of those things. Um, memory creation and storage is a really interesting one. So when you are in deep sleep, you are creating memories. That is how our body changes what we did and learned during that day into the short-term and long-term memory that then we can pull from later on. This not only includes the memory of an event or an experience or a feeling, but it also includes motor memory or what we consider neuroplasticity. So all of the work that Nick does with his athletes or all of the work that your coaches do with your kids in practice has to become motor memory if they really want to excel at their sport at any point in time. So really great sleep is kind of critical for this. It also reserves energy. So your brain only uses about half of the glucose or energy that it does during the day when you're sleeping. So because it's only using half, it allows time for your body to kind of restore those energy reserves so that when you wake up the next day, you have more energy, both mentally and physically. Long-term effects of good, consistent sleep are a decreased risk of cardiovascular disease, decreased risk of high blood pressure, and a decreased risk of diabetes. So for some of our younger athletes, that's not the kinds of things that we're thinking about in the forefront of our mind, but our younger athletes are those people who go on to live long, healthy, happy lives. So if we can lay a good sleep foundation now and get them into some good sleep habits, long-term, we're seeing a lot of benefits as well. Sleep requirements. I don't know anybody who gets this, except my one-year-old son who doesn't have a choice of when he goes to bed. Uh, adults are, on average, need about eight hours of sleep. I think right now the national average in the U.S. is 6.2 or 6.4 hours, just based on the demands of our life and our work and all that stuff. But you can see the younger you are, the more sleep you need. So school-aged children and teens need about 10 to 12 hours of sleep. Babies and toddlers need about 11 to 14 hours of sleep. If you want to get into the nitty gritty, uh, the younger you are, the more deep sleep you have because you are actually creating more memories. You think about younger kids learning. They just learn a lot more than adults do on any given day. They need to create those memories and store them so they actually have a higher proportion of that deep sleep. Um, I don't know about the communities that all of you guys live in, but in the primary community I work in, New Canaan, this year they've actually changed some school hours so the high school kids can start a little bit later to try and get them closer to that 10 to 12 hours of sleep versus starting them closer to 7 a.m. where they might be missing out on a little bit of sleep. So just an interesting community change that I've observed in the last year or so. Um, the school district's actually trying to make changes to allow for kids to get a little bit more sleep. Uh, sleep helps the immune system. 
So it decreases overall cortisol levels, which is your stress hormone. So obviously talking about burnout, talking about physical stress, mental stress, wanting decreased levels of cortisol is great because overall it can help our stress levels. It increases human growth hormone. So when you're injured, this is really great because those are the cells that actually help repair your tissue. And if you're not injured, these are the cells that help regenerate new healthy tissue just as a part of a normal breakdown from day to day. So if Nick is taking someone through a strength training program, you're going to have some breakdown of muscle tissue as he works, you know, different muscle groups, this human growth hormone can actually help restore some good tissue and good cells there. Um, it also helps better your T cell function and your helper T cell function, which are your fighter cells of your immune system. So these are the cells that find and, and detect infection in your body and help fight that before you even know what's going on. So as you can see, good sleep habits overall, not just gonna lead to better physical performance in terms of sport, but also gonna lead to overall better health. And the same can be true about bad sleep. So all the good things that happen with good sleep, you can just flip for bad sleep. All these great things are not going to happen. You're going to get sick a little bit more often. You're going to get run down a little faster, burn out like we talked about. How well are you sleeping? So you can get really technical, um, which I do with an aura ring, which tracks your sleep habits. It looks at how much time you're spending in each stage of sleep, how long it takes you to fall asleep, what your heart rate is, all that stuff. You can use the whoop strap, you can use an Apple watch, but really when it comes to our student athletes and our younger kids, it's about how you feel, right? Are you well rested? Do you get up in the morning with some sense of energy that you have actually restored your energy overnight? Do you come home every day and need a nap because you're not west, uh, resting well enough at night or not getting enough sleep at night? So for your kids, for your athletes who are out there, it's really just a matter of checking in. It's like, do you actually feel rested when you wake up? Or do you feel like you slept eight hours, but they weren't great eight hours and you still feel tired? And then my favorite, what can you do to improve sleep? So to summarize what sleep, what great sleep habits are, I mean, there are endless number of things you can change, but here are some of the easier things I think with a couple of caveats. So avoiding caffeine late in the day. If your kids are like eight, nine, 10 years old, probably not an issue. I started drinking coffee when I was like in high school, probably not great, should have held off a little bit more, but avoiding caffeine later in the day is super important. So caffeine actually has a half-life of six hours, meaning six hours later, you still have half of that caffeine in your system. So if I have a coffee at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, by the time midnight rolls around, the caffeine is just finally out of my system. So people who are maybe a little bit more caffeine sensitive or who are new to drinking coffee or tea or anything like that, you want to make sure that you're drinking it earlier in the day. This applies to all ages across the lifespan. Um, avoiding eating or exercising right before bed. They both lead to a longer period of falling into some of those deeper sleep stages. So if you can avoid exercising or eating right before bed, that would be ideal. I know this is not always feasible. As someone who grew up competitively swimming, my practice was from 6 to 8.30 at night. I would get home at 9 and I would eat and I'd go to bed at 10. There is nothing I'm going to do to change that. So I understand that this is not always feasible. In a perfect world, you would stop eating around 6 p.m. You'd go to bed around 9 p.m. and all would be great. But I understand this is one of the more challenging things to change when you don't dictate your own sports schedule. Decreasing artificial light later in the day is really important. So artificial light can be as simple as the light bulbs above you, um, lamps, TVs, that kind of thing. It is more challenging in the winter when the sun sets earlier because we need light to see what we're doing. So this one is a little bit easier to manage in the spring and summer where it's daylight a little bit longer and we don't have to turn on the lights quite as much. Um, that goes right into minimizing TV, phone, tablet, two to three hours before bed. So all that artificial light that we are taking in with screens and with TVs and with phones and tablets um, actually slow the release of melatonin in your body. And so you don't get to sleep as quickly because the melatonin levels haven't built up yet. Again, very challenging with schoolwork. Most of the kids I treat say that everything they do is on the computer. So if you get home from sports and it's time to do homework, you don't really have a choice. So again, minimizing it as much as possible, doing as much with like a Kindle or an actual physical textbook versus a computer is always going to be better. But understanding that this is one of those things that it, it, it is more challenging. Dark bedroom, no TV, blackout curtains, sleep shade, keeping it as dark as possible, no little lights flashing around, keeping it as dark as you can is gonna lead to better sleep just overall. 
Keeping the bedroom cool is another one. So 65 degrees has been shown to be kind of the sweet spot. To me, this is a little bit of a personal preference. 65 degrees can get pretty cold, especially when outside is, you know, temperatures are dropping, but something that feels cooler will actually help your body decrease its internal temperature, which is what promotes better sleep. And then to help lower your body's temperature, you can do things like don't wear socks to bed, keep your feet out of the covers or wash your hands and face right before bed, which actually just promotes a physiological uh, body temperature change. And then promoting a wind down routine. So change into your pajamas, wash your face, brush your teeth. The things you do kind of in the same order every night before you go to bed can help signal to your brain that it's time to wind down and go to sleep and gets you kind of into the zone of, okay, it's bedtime. And then the hardest thing to do as a kid who plays sports in, in school is getting up at the same time on the weekends as you do during the week and going to bed at the same time. So I would rather someone wake up at 7 a.m. every single day and take a nap on the weekends to catch up on a little bit of sleep, then sleep in until 12, two days, and then start getting up at seven on Monday. So if we can get our sleep schedules as consistent as possible, our body's internal clock can set a little bit better and not be as disrupted when you have someone who stays up super late on a Friday, wakes up really late on a Saturday, same thing on Sunday, and then Monday morning, they're up at seven or six or even earlier to go to school. So these are just some of the major tips that are a little bit easier to implement. Um, and what I always tell people, and which has kind of been the theme throughout tonight, is consistency. So you're not going to um, implement all of these things at once, right? You're going to pick one that seems a little bit more feasible. Nick called it low-hanging fruit, right? What is the easiest thing you can possibly change that might help lead to better sleep that you can be consistent with? For me, it's a wind down routine. I'm going to do the same thing every night before I go to bed just to trigger my brain into saying, okay, it is time to settle down for the night. So can I minimize TV? Absolutely. Do I always do it? No. So I pick one of these things that seems the most feasible for me so I can be the most consistent with it over the course of the week or the month or the year. And over time, it becomes a habit. And then you don't even think about it. And it's just what you do. Um, so that is all I have in terms of sleep. I would like to just summarize briefly and I'll leave the context slide up so anyone can take down our email addresses if you have any specific questions about your student athlete. This is also going to be recorded. Somebody asked in the chat before. So we're recording this and we will make it available to anyone who's watching or those who were unable to attend tonight. Um, but to summarize everything, I think it's easy to see when we present it like this, how each facet plays into the next and affects the next, right? If you are doing an amazing job strength training, but you are not eating anything, you're, you know, you are McDonald's every day, you are eating pizza all the time, you're only focusing on pasta, right? You are going to not get the benefits or as many of the benefits as you could if you were eating right. If you are working on preventing burnout or really enjoying your sport, not becoming overwhelmed, working on some of those mental stressors that Ariana talked about, but then you don't sleep at all. You're not giving your body a chance, your physical and mental to combat some of that fatigue and to bring up your energy reserves. So really, when we look at it, we are each an expert in one field or you know a field or two. But when you bring a whole team together and you really look at it from all the dimensions, you can see how much they play on each other and they interfere or interact, they hinder or they help, just depending on what you're doing to kind of better your athlete. So I will pass it back to Dr. Kowalski for just any closing remarks. Um, and I'll just leave the contact slide up for now in case anyone needs the um, emails. Thank you so much for that, Ashley. I think I couldn't agree more. I think this multidisciplinary approach is sort of exactly what we all hope for in putting together all the different puzzle pieces that athletes and families need in order to, number one, avoid injury and stay on the field. And then number two, perform at their highest level and achieve whatever goals they've set for themselves. So I just want to thank each and every one of you for bringing your expertise to bear. I know that our audience is going to benefit from it. Um, and I want to thank our attendees for taking time out of a weekday evening to uh, spend time with us and learn a little bit about these issues. So thanks to you three and to Performance Health in general for being a great partner in the community. Thanks so much, Dr. Polsky. Great. Take care, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.